we'll talk about capnography for the measurement of CO2 and understanding how um, and why measurement of CO2 is, is physiologically important. So the first thing we're going to focus on is measuring oxygenation. And again, we have these two important gases, oxygen and CO2, and both of these are measured clinically. And, and principally how oxygen is measured is through pulse oximetry. So this is a, a common a device is seen in hospitals and outpatient clinics. Uh, you put this device on the end of the finger and it displays the hemoglobin saturation. So we've talked about uh, what hemoglobin saturation is, the extent to which the hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen. Normal value should be about 98%. And so it's shown here on the reading in this case is 99% uh, hemoglobin saturation. Uh, and, and, this is, and this over here would be the heart rate. And so this value comes up very quick. And so pulse oximetry, it's very simple. It's non-invasive. Uh, it gives you a relatively accurate meeting relatively quickly. Again, it can be done most anywhere. And this will give you a sense of oxygenation. Reading of 99% indicates overall oxygenation is good for this patient. Um, maybe some other issues with them, but certainly not in oxygenation. And so with pulse oximetry, is defined from as oxygen. Uh, again, um, the ox containing oxygen is the measurement of oxygen. The, the metry is to measure um, as far as the uh, ideology of these words. And pulse, the pulse and pulse oximetry means it's intermittent and it's not, it's, it's picking up the intermittent signal uh, and not the continuous signal. So we're going to talk a little bit more about this in terms of what that means. So essentially pulse oximetry is measuring the intermittent uh, measure of oxygen uh, and displaying that in terms of the hemoglobin saturation. So again, every time we talk about pulse ox and, and the number that it generates is what essentially it's telling us is the hemoglobin saturation value uh, in that particular patient. So what we know about oxygen, we go back to our oxyhemoglobin curve, and, and um, we spend a lot of time on this in normal PaO2. You can have sea level breathing room air should be about 100. This would correspond to an arterial content on uh, mLs of oxygen per deciliter of blood of about 20. And our hemoglobin saturation should be about 98%. Again, we know that our total oxygen is the sum of our hemoglobin bound and our dissolved. Uh, we've talked about how in the case of carbon monoxide poisoning, we lose a lot of our hemoglobin saturation, and, and that can be lethal. If, it, you know, if the carbon monoxide is of high enough concentration or long enough duration, it will, it will certainly be lethal. And what the pulse oximetry is measuring is that it's actually measuring this component here. It's measuring the, the amount of hemoglobin, again, the, excuse me, the amount of oxygen that's bound to hemoglobin. And again, normally that 98% of a normal value, that's, um, uh, again, what it's measuring is the oxyhemoglobin um, saturation. And so we're going to focus a little bit more on this then, and again, understanding what that machine is doing. And again, it's in, in, as far as what it's measuring is this specific red line of the curve. And, um, and, and that's important because, again, what we can do is from this, for example, we talked about 60-90. If we came back and we were about 90% saturated, which is right about in here, we would know that we were we could deduce that the PO2, PaO2 should be about 60 millimeters of mercury. And as far as the content, that should be about 18 mLs of oxygen per deciliter of blood. And again, we talked about this is the critical point that this really is, is essentially a clinical hypoxemia. What it means is we need to boost these patients or a patient would need to be moved back up this line to a higher amount and really can't afford to fall much farther to the left here. So again, understanding what any of these values are, in the hemoglobin saturation, we can always refer to this curve and again, figure out both PA, deduce both PaO2 as well as the, oxy, um, the content, the, the oxygen content in arterial blood. So again, pulse oximeter, pulse oximetry is measuring um, oxyhemoglobin um, saturation, and, and that goes back really to hemoglobin, as we discussed previously, it is four different polypeptide chains that are held together in a single protein. We talked about how each polypeptide chain has a heme group that's in the center. Each heme group has an iron that's absolutely critical for binding oxygen, and then each one of these hemes can bind an O2 group. So within a hemoglobin, uh, we have four hemes, and each one of these uh, generally has, uh, in arterial blood, would have four oxygens um, bound onto, there'd be four oxygen total, one here, one here, one in this uh, chain, one on that chain, again, bound, bound to hemoglobin. And so what this then gets to a little bit is just to understand a couple things. So just keep in mind the hemoglobin can bind oxygen and react with oxygen to form um, oxyhemoglobin, which is shown here. And now what we're going to get into is two really different ways to display this. So this is some nomenclature um, that we haven't really seen, so it's some new one. So this is the S little a O2. And what this means is the saturation of, of hemoglobin, but it's an arterial. So it's the, it's the um, oxyhemoglobin saturation from an arterial blood gas measurement. And, and again, we know we, we talked about a value, again, let's say being 98%, a normal oxyhemoglobin being 98%. But what happens, though, is it can be really measured from one of two places. It can be measured directly from arterial blood, or again, it can be determined by the pulse oximetry machine. And so how we determine, how we differentiate between those, is the, in this case, it's the S little a. So it's the pulse, um, the saturation of oxyhemoglobin from arterial blood versus the SP. So this is the pulse, this is the saturation pulse ox um, uh, for, um, again, it means this number is derived from pulse oximetry. So again, the important thing here then is reporting of any of these numbers, you have to look at this and, and SAO2 means it's actually from an arterial, a direct arterial blood gas measurement. And SPO2 means it's a pulse oximetry. And as we'll discuss in a minute, pulse oximetry has the advantage of, of, of being quick, being rapid, being mobile again it can be done um, uh, paramedics for example would carry these emts would carry this it can be done at the, um, in an accident scene um, but it makes certain inferences about it whereas an arterial blood gas is an actual measurement it's a direct measurement that by far is the most reliable but again the problem is if you're not near uh, an arterial blood gas machine that will preclude you from, from getting that measurement so we'll talk a little bit more about this but again the important thing understanding s little a means arterial blood gas sp is the saturation from pulse oximetry <clears throat> And so what is pulse oximetry? And so briefly, and again, staying very briefly, that uh, device is put on the end of the finger and it really shoots two lights. There's a red and an infrared. And there's a light source and there's a detector. So here is essentially the source being shot through the finger and here's the detector on the other side. There's also some degree of, of refraction that, that comes off of this. And the, the kind of the nuts and bolts really of what's going on is what the machine integrates is the ratio of the red to the infrared. And depending on what that ratio is, it's directly relevant to the, to the hemoglobin, it directly correlates to, um, it can be related to the hemoglobin saturation. So for example, two 
uh, principal numbers are really the um, common numbers, is that the ratio of red to infrared is 0 0.5. That means that the hemoglobin saturation is 100%. And in the case with the red to infrared, the ratio is 1.0. That means hemoglobin saturation is 82%. So again, all I want you to take home from this slide, again, is understanding the device goes on your finger. Um, it shoots a red and an infrared. It's, it's detecting absorbance. It's, it's detecting reflection. It integrates the ratio of these signals, and, and based on what that ratio is, it can, it can tell us what the hemoglobin saturation is. And it displays it on that machine again, 98%, 99%, 100%, 100%. Um, again, displaying it in that way. So again, it's this ability to, to send out a red and infrared light signal and, and integrate those signals. And so as far as the um, the, the pulse portions, we talked is pulse oximetry. And so keep in mind what we have then is, you know, we constantly have blood in, in the vessel, but we also have a pulsatile signal, which is um, essentially when, when the left ventricle ejects blood in the aorta. And so that's, if we go to the doctor and the hospital, you know, someone will come along and, and, and take our pulse. And so you can feel that pulsatile signal. And so what this cartoon kind of illustrates is, is this red light and infrared light is picking up constant signal. It sees this, which can either be venous blood or it can be constant uh, non-pulsatile arterial blood, which is shown here. But there's always a signal that, that is, is, is it comes along in a pulsatile nature. And again, this corresponds to um, the ejection of the left ventricle into the aorta where we see this uh, happening. And, and so really what the machine can focus on and what can integrate, it, it kind of sees this as background and subtracts it away. And what it's focusing on is a signal. And, and that's important because ultimately what we want to do is we want to get the, the, the oxyhemoglobin saturation the percent value. We want it off the arterial blood and we certainly don't want it um, off the venous blood. So it, it, it senses the constant signal. It, it, it uh, subtracts that away as background and then focuses on this pulsatile signal. So that's the, the derivation of where the, uh, the pulse oximeter came. Again, it's, it wants to get an oxyhemoglobin concentration, but it, it's doing it in a pulsatile manner, not in a constant manner. So this just cartoon just kind of illustrates, again, the different components and how it wants to uh, reduce these as background, and then again, focus on the pulsatile nature of the signal. And again, that gives rise to our, uh, the value that we, that we want. And again, what we want is we want the measurement of arterial blood, and we certainly don't want a measurement of the venous blood. Again, typically, a venous blood, the hemoglobin saturation is 75%. And if that was coming up as a as a value, obviously that would be a clear, a clear sign of hypoxemia. But but again, but that's quite normal for venous blood. It's certainly abnormal and low for arterial blood. So again, how the machine differentiates that is really focusing on the pulsatile nature of that signal. And so what might cause some problems? Again, it, you know, one advantage as I mentioned is again, it, it, this device is very it's mobile, it's quick, it's rapid, um, it's it's very efficient, um, and, and and again, it provides very good numbers. And so, um, but what, there are a couple issues and limitations about it. And so one of them is, is the light source. So the, the device is driven by a battery, and when the battery goes down, the light source goes down, and when the light source um, goes down, the numbers are unreliable. So it's important to make sure that the battery is, is appropriate, that the signal is appropriate. Um, if it's not, it'll uh, start giving out abnormal numbers, and that can be problematic. Another one too is generally it's attached onto fingers. Um, however, it does not work on fingernails. So just making sure that. Um, Again, the, the uh, device uh, can't read blood in, in false fingernails, but it can certainly read uh, pulse oximetry, the hemoglobin saturation in a finger. So just have to make sure it's actually put on the skin and, and not anything that, that does not have uh, blood perfusing through it. So another thing about pulse oximetry is, is kind of a, an Achilles heel of it is, again, this, this, this integration of, of signal red to infrared. Um, and again, what, what it's looking at is it can differentiate normally, again, uh, a, a reduced hemoglobin shown here versus an oxyhemoglobin. But there's two other things that really throw the, the device for a loop. And so this, this is something that has to be uh, treated as a, with a caveat. So one is met hemoglobin, and so we'll uh, discuss this more in a second. And the other is carbon monoxide. We've, we've certainly discussed carbon monoxide before, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. So carbon monoxide and met hemoglobin are, are, are two things that can happen and do happen that um, really uh, the pulse oximeter, for lack of a better word, is, is kind of faked out on these things and, and essentially gives false readings. So this is something that, again, caveats that have to be looked at when using pulse oximetry, again, knowing what your strengths are and what the weaknesses of, of this particular device. So specifically about the, um, the effect here of what, um, what's going on. So again, what we know is, is here is here's an oxyhemoglobin um, curve. And again, what, what these um, uh, extinction coefficients are, here's the reduced. And, and what the machine can do, again, it can, it can pick up the difference between the reduced and the oxyhemoglobin. But, but as it turns out, met hemoglobin gives signals that are very similar to that. And so the question is, what is met hemoglobin? And, and the iron in this case is in the ferric. It's in the plus three state. It's not in the ferrous plus two, st uh, plus two state. And it turns out when you're in the plus three, it cannot bind oxygen. And so the issue here then, again, the problem is what's happening is the machine is clearly detecting uh, the hemoglobin. It's detecting uh, iron on it, but it, just, it cannot distinguish. It, it should be uh, uh, a plus two, um, and it, it can't tell that it's plus three. And, and, and the reality is, is what the machine thinks. The machine thinks it's, it's, plus, it's a plus two with oxygen. Uh, it's a ferrous uh, group. In fact, it has oxygen bound, but in reality, it's a ferric, a plus three group, which there is no oxygen on that. And, and it, the machine is un unable to differentiate that. So, so it gives you, the, the bottom line is it gives you a relatively, it gives you a false reading telling you the hemoglobin saturation looks very good, that there's lots of, lots of oxygen bound to the hemoglobin, when in fact there's really a, a not as much or not any oxygen that can be bound to the hemoglobin, again, if the iron switches to a ferric state. We talked about carbon monoxide. Um, it binds, um, it can bind a hemoglobin, and it directly competes with the oxygen binding site. And again, the affinity for, for carbon monoxide for hemoglobin at the oxygen binding site is about 250 fold greater than oxygen. The problem, though, the pulse oximeter cannot distinguish um, between uh, carbon monoxide and, and oxygen. Um, if, if either one is bound, as far as the pulse oximeter is concerned, that looks like oxygen bound to hemoglobin. And so it'll tell you that your saturation looks really, really good. Uh, everything is A-OK, -okay, but the reality is, is in fact, your saturation is very low. 
we talked about some of the examples, your oxygen saturation may drop down to 50% because all the, the other, the, the remaining 50% of the sites are bound with, with carbon monoxide. Um, but again, as far as the, the pulse oximeter will tell you that everything is about 98, 99% saturated when in fact it's not. And so this is illustrated then a little bit here, and this kind of gets into the difference then what we talked about is the difference between understanding SAO2 versus SPO2. So the, the SA is the, is the arterial blood measurement. And so what's, what's graphed here is, is on this curve is either the SPO2 or the SAO2. So this is the hemoglobin saturation measured either by pulse oximetry or arterial blood gas and as a, as a function of, of net hemoglobin percent. So what we see here, and we'll start with, with the red. So this is uh, the red, is the, and, and this is an arterial blood gas. And what it shows us is this is your... The red line is you're showing your, your oxyhemoglobin concentration um, as a function of, of methemoglobin. And as your methemoglobin goes higher, you're, if you, again, this, this baric state is not binding oxygen, and we see that overall the oxyhemoglobin concentration comes down. But the problem is in blue, if, if you're measuring it by pulse oximetry, which is in blue, you can see here the line doesn't really drop that much. So overall, in, in, the, in the face of very, very high methemoglobin, again, it's in the ferric state, um, 40, 50, 60 percent, is to, you know, again, this cannot bind oxygen. But when you look at the, at the pulse oximeter, it's telling you, you know, things aren't that bad. I mean, they're certainly somewhat bad, um, but you see you have a high degree of, of, of oxygen saturation on your hemoglobin. But the reality is, 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 as it turns out, in fact, you're direly, um, you're in a dire position where, where your um, oxyhemoglobin percent is very, very low. And so, again, the take home here to simply understand is, um, the machine, the pulse oximeter, cannot distinguish, again, this, this ability. It, it interprets an F, FB plus 3, how it interprets that as an FB plus 2 with oxygen, um, a plus 2 uh, ferrous uh, iron with oxygen bound to it when, in fact, it's not. So the bottom line is this. Again, pulse oximetry is good. It's fast. It's efficient. It gives you a, a, a number, a reasonable number as a starting point, but it's not the most accurate. The most accurate way is, in fact, to take an arterial blood gas, measure it directly, and get a sense of what your, what your oxygen saturation is. So, again, what this graph illustrates, increasing methemoglobin, which is bad. The uh, arterial blood gas indicates that, that again, the values just continue to fall, the, the oxyhemoglobin uh, saturation the percent continues to fall, but the pulse oximeter just does not pick that up, again, because of this Achilles heel that it has, being unable to discriminate between the plus two and the plus three. The other one graph is, is really the same thing with, with carbon um, monoxide bound to hemoglobin. So this is carbon monoxide increasing um, along uh, this axis um, from, from left, left to right. And so what's shown here then is, is this just shows overall the, the measurement of the pulse oximeter. Uh, so the pulse oximeter is, is um, um, in the face of very high carbon monoxide concentrations, overall, it says oxyhemoglobin uh, percent looks pretty good. Again, not 98%, but maybe about 95%, and certainly no lower than 90%. So uh, according to the pulse oximeter, things don't look that bad. But the reality is if you take from an arterial blood gas measurement, uh, and you look through here, you can see, in fact, that your oxyhemoglobin is, is decreasing uh, significantly. And, and again, we talked about this, of how when carbon monoxide increases, again, it's going to drive off your oxygen and competitively displaces it. So again, it, this kind of underscores the, the, the problem of... Um, um, of, of pulse oximetry, again, it, it gives you false readings telling you everything's okay when in reality things are not. So bottom line is pulse oximetry is good, it has limitations, but if you want the most accurately, you need an arterial blood gas, but again, sometimes it's not always available to you. And one of the last things then is, is to understand is we talked about just a few numbers as far as the pulse oximeter, and so we talked about 6090 before, and this is relating, relating with the value of what pulse oximetry can do in when it's working and understanding its caveats is if you get a measurement 90% saturation, it means about, it's about the PO2 is 60. If you get a 75% saturation, it's a PO2 of 40. If you get a 60% saturation, PO2 is 30. And, and it just allows us to determine or infer what the PAO2 is if we can get a pulse oximetry number. And again, we can get the number within a matter of seconds. And again, we can make these assumptions based on the oxyhemoglobin curve. So, and this is really the utility and the value of it. And certainly understand that we mentioned before, anytime your PAO2 goes below 60, which is equivalent to a 90% saturation, we're, we're talking about clinical hypoxemia. So the last thing we're gonna talk about here then is capnography. So capnography measures carbon dioxide uh, in a sample of air. And there's really two main ways to do that. And, and as it turns out, each has its strengths and weaknesses. So the first one is called mainstream, and it uses infrared spectrometry, but it requires innovation. So this requires a, um, um, a, a tube is, uh, asserted into the tra into tracheal tube um, that is put into the uh, patient, and then the tube is put on the end of that, so all the air is captured. And so as the patient is breathing out, the air is passing through this infrared source, the CO2, and as it passes through here, it's displayed and, and detected. So this is the mainstream. Again, this would be the patient here. You're blowing through the tube. The CO2 is passing through here. Essentially, it's measured, and then it goes off to these circuits to be um, um, dumped and, and, and basically dumped out here and not re-inhaled back uh, for the patient and not re-inhaled. So this is, the, this is the main stream. And the side stream, though, in this case, is here's the patient breathing out through a tube. And what you have then is a side stream uh, tube that comes over here, and essentially the CO2 is picked up um, on the side stream apparatus, not on the mainstream. And the patient breathes back in, and again, the circuit setup, so no CO2 is, 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 um, is, is re-inhaled. So the difference, again, is, is really um, the CO2 passing, all the CO2 passing directly through the, uh, through the main uh, the infrared detector in the main uh, uh, stream setup versus over here, a portion of it uh, peeled off and sent through the side stream. And, and so one of the, you know, the advantages is this certainly is measuring all your CO2 that's coming out. Um, that's the advantage of it, but the disadvantage requires intubation in the placement of an endotracheal tube. Um, side stream can be used with, with nasal cannula. We'll talk a second about this. This is, um, so again, a little bit easier to use, but you can sometimes you can get some false readings, and, and so we'll uh, discuss that here in a second. So as far as the capnography, again, what, what we want to do is want to measure CO2 and measure the ventilation, how much CO2 is being produced. And so one of the ways is through a chemical method, and it's pH sensitive. So it's purple. This is, is, the, is the air moves through this, um, basically through this device. 
um, when oxygen is passing through it, uh, it it's purple, and, and, and it, but it changes color, but it goes yellow in CO2, at least about 4% CO2 is passing across it. So um, what's shown here then is here's, here's actually a tube um, uh, that's for this device, and again, is, is um, oxygen comes in, it goes purple, but the CO2 is blown out. And this just tells you at least, and this can, is a quick indicator of whether or not someone is, is ventilating appropriately and, and blowing out uh, CO2, again, simply by uh, a, a quick color change of this thing. And, and again, this is a relatively a quick and, and, and efficient way to get a measurement assessment of whether or not CO2 is being produced by the, uh, by the patient. And then this just indicates, um, as far as understanding, where exactly is CO2 being produced. And so here's over time, and so what we see on this graph over time, it goes down, and all of a sudden, if we're analyzing, if we're, if we're on a capnograph, um, uh, if we're doing capnography measuring CO2 concentration, so where is it being measured, and, and, and so at what point, essentially, um, represents exhalation here. And, and so what we see is that across time, there's no CO2, and all of a sudden, it's picked up by the machine. And then it goes back down again. And so hopefully what we know is we always blow, when we blow out, we're blowing out CO2. And so that's what's being picked up here. This is exhalation. And then we breathe in, we're breathing in air. It's high in oxygen and low in CO2. And so it's passing through the device essentially goes back down. And now what it's picking up is the oxygen and no CO2. So which part, which point represents or which air represents exhalation? It certainly should be A and not B. Again, exhalation is, is, is um, synonymous with, again, um, the blowing out of CO2 and essentially moving through this device. And when there's no CO2 that's, that's in the air that's, being, that's passing, through, passing through the device, again, that would be consistent with inspiration, uh, which has high oxygen but low CO2. And this just shows that peak a little bit more, kind of blows it up, where again, is, is once the patient starts breathing out and the CO2 starts to be detected, generally this, this peak um, for the capnogram uh, has four distinct phases to it. So there's the carbon dioxide being cleared from the anatomic dead space. Um, again, so what that means is the patient had breathed in that last 150 of air that came in is the first one to come back out now. And then they start, B is kind of the increasing CO2 uh, moving up and they start to um, have dead space um, ventilation and, and alveolar uh, carbon dioxide. So they're now blowing that out. Um, C is the alveolar plateau, and then E is the end tidal carbon dioxide. And this is kind of really the measurement that people look at. And so this is the, the last point of the level of CO2, which is about 40 millimeters of mercury. Um, this is equivalent, again, to the alveolar concentration, which, you know, um, which it should be. And so this is the end tidal uh, CO2. And, and then at this point, basically, there's inspiration uh, at, at this, uh, the next breath. And so you, you see at this point the um, uh, CO2 rapidly dropping back down. So it's, it's really the, the, the end tidal, the uh, PET CO2 that is, is, is used as kind of the, the benchmark of ultimately what is the final CO2 level from this patient. Uh, patient. So again, capnogram and, and, and just the different phases of the capnogram and, um, and the initial clearing of, of the uh, anatomic dead space and um, again, eventually the alveolar carbon dioxide, the alveolar plateau, and finally the, the end tidal carbon dioxide. And then the diaphragm contracting and air moving back in to slow the CO2. And we see this coming back down. And keep in mind that the normal clinically a normal clinical value is estimated to be about 35 to uh, excuse me 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury again with the mean being about 40 is what a normal co2 should be and then uh, just lastly here um, again capnography there's we talked about this from the side stream and the mainstream so side stream is very good and quick and it can and it can work with the nasal cannula so a lot of times patients is, instead of being intubate, intubated just have this nasal cannula hooked around their ears it's blowing oxygen in their nose that helps them to maintain their oxygen but the problem with this is, is this sometimes when you're Using the side stream, you can underestimate, underestimate the CO2 because of mixing with room air, um, which has virtually no CO2. So in other words, again, this, there's just leaks in the system. Um, you're, you're, um, since it's not directly from the source, it's getting mixed in with, with room air, with ambient air, again, which has no CO2. So overall, what you get is readings uh, on the capnogram, which are generally lower than, in fact, what, what's really there. But this is avoided in the mainstream because of the intubation. So it's shown here. Is the and the tracheal tube placed down into the trachea? It's capturing directly everything from the lungs. It, it goes through. It's analyzed um, through the machine. So there's no mixing of the ambient air. It's, it's collecting everything from. Uh, so this is definitely more accurate. The mainstream is more accurate. But again, the limitation is, is it requires the placement of an endotracheal tube. And, and in some cases, that just might not be an option to be able to do. So just understanding in kind of the strengths and weaknesses of each of these procedures. So these are the uh, summary of the key points in for clinical assessment of, of both oxygenation and, and ventilation. Um, again, through both pulse oximetry and uh, capnography.